Good morning, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Paul Caritas, and today I'm going to be giving you a little talk on a very important figure in Western esoteric tradition and Christian mysticism, that being Emanuel Swedenborg. And I'll start with a quote from one of his books called The True Christian Religion. It's from paragraph 332. A voice from heaven then said to me, You shall see and hear. So I departed into the spirit world and saw before me an opening, which I approached and examined. And behold, there was a ladder, and by this I descended. Emanuel Swedenborg, 1688 to 1771, is perhaps the most important interpreter of the Western esoteric tradition in the 18th century, having pioneered a contemplative the theological system of the cosmos that assimilated aspects of Enlightenment science, theosophy, and rationalism and extended the empirical approach to the spiritual realm. To say that he wasn't a spiritualist or spiritually minded is akin to proposing that water isn't wet or fire doesn't burn. Interestingly, the belief in disembodied entities has been entrenched in human consciousness for time immemorial and had formed a fundamental component of innumerable religious philosophies, though it isn't until Swedenborg that the exact nature of the correspondence between the physical and the spiritual becomes clear. In adhering to a bird's eye view of his life, one sees that the decisive vision of vocation in 1744 that enabled practical application of ethereal hierarchies, emanations, and correspondences culminated with a spiritual dimension to biblical exegesis and formed a new Christianity uh, were not unprecedented. Uh, in his formative years, the man had been exposed to Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, and the Christian Kabbalah by Eric Venzelius his brother-in-law. Further, he maintained relations with Rabbi Haim Samuel Jacob Falk, uh, a Kabbalist and alchemist from London whose unrelenting esoteric exploits earned him national fame. Despite the mechanistic and scientific pursuits and activities that were preeminent and pivotal early in his intellectual life, Swedenborg's formative environment was also underrun by occult philosophy and mystical law. The main exponent of Swedenborg's spiritualism is, of course, the intuitive system of hidden knowledge that was emancipated when his religious persona finally broke through. The accompanying vision in which he was allowed to revel in the presence of Jesus Christ dressed in robes of imperial purple and majestic white was understood as a calling to fulfill a divinely appointed role that involved experiencing the afterlife transition into a transcendental metaphysical realm firsthand and henceforth enlightening the world of the living with specific details pertaining to the exact nature of that transition. Contrary to what many have written about him, Swedenborg was not a charlatan. If anything, he was a mentally balanced, intellectual and single-minded individual who bequeathed to the notion of life after death a fertile unprecedented sentiment of integrity and respectability. The scope of his paraphysical claims and talents is impressive. The communication of messages between the living and the departed, for which there is some viable evidence. Visitations to ethereal dimensions like heaven and hell. The moon and the planets, conversing with angels, demons and other disembodied entities therein, and even disengaging uh, his own conscious from his physical body. All these controversial extrasensory endeavours, um, according to Swedenborg, were voluntary and could be induced at will utilizing a controlled hypnagogic or semi-trance-like state in which the individual current uh, conscious currently embodies an active and passive state of being. Ruminations in his personal dream diary, in which this contracted form of consciousness is called passive potency, definitely attest to such and recalls the words of Rudolf Steiner. Nay, there is another kind of vision which comes in a state between sleep and wakefulness. The man that supposes that he is fully awake as it were, inasmuch as his senses are all active. In any case, this visionary faculty was to motivate a plethora of theologically um, flavoured pietistic writing, the most prominent being a compendium of eight books published in 1758 that were based entirely on scripture, the Arcana Coelestia, or Heavenly Secrets in English. More importantly, though, it generated a breeding ground for the evolution of modern spiritualism and psychic research in the 1850s, uh, as well as 
basically transcendentalism and Mormonism, religious factions autochthonous to America that assimilated hermetic, gnostic and magical conceptions about God and the greater cosmos. As recent scholarship uh, on the subject will confirm, religious philosophy was never quite absent from Sweater Morgan's life. One's biological parents are usually fundamental to their psychosocial development and spiritual orientation. Swedenborg's father, Jesper Swedenborg, was a Lutheran bishop who acquired some very prominent positions within ecclesiastical hierarchy in Sweden. He was well acquainted with the Puritan and Pietistic movements and espoused paranormal beliefs. Emmanuel confirmed the presence of these early uh, influences in a written letter to Dr. Gabriel Bayer of Gothenburg, a professor of Greek at Gothenburg University, in which he declared brusquely that from my fourth to my tenth year I was constantly engaged in thoughts upon God, salvation and the spiritual diseases of men. Soon afterwards, at the tender age of 15, Swedenborg went to live with Eric Benzelius, his brother-in-law, and that's where the gilded uh, gates leading to the labyrinth and terrain of esotericism were flung right open. The latter was an occult dabbler, and enthusiast, having traversed Europe for the sake of gaining instruction in philosophy, descrying the Pythagorean Kabbalah and engaging with like-minded people in esoteric circles such as the Philadelphia Society in London. When Swedenborg arrived, Benzelius was deeply ensconced in a Kabbalistic rendering of the New Testament under the auspices and guidance of a converted Jew named Moses Ben Aaron of Krakow. This fascination with esoteric Judaism and Orientalism certainly rubbed off on the young, impressionable and intellectually curious Swedenborg, who would eventually imbue much of this knowledge into his own theological speculations. Swedenborg's early fascination with mystical law may have facilitated long-term intercourse with esoteric circles like the Jacobites, the Freemasons and the Philadelphia Society in London, with which his brother-in-law had sustained a close affiliation. In fact, there is some statistical likelihood to the notion that Swedenborg was somehow involved with a ladder given the aforementioned along with the cult's propensity to identify powerfully with the Lutheran theosophy and Christian mysticism of Jacob Bohm, uh, London was definitely an auspicious, momentous uh, and providential hunting ground for Swedenborg, for he inaugurated lasting relations with Rabbi Samuel Jacob Falk, a self-styled alchemist, practical Kabbalist um, and a magician whose reputed supernatural powers miracle working pursuits and philosophical insights aligned Swedenborg with esoteric notions of vitalism, teleology and salvific theology. In 1710, Swedenborg disembarked in London with the sole intent of furthering the geometric and mechanistic frontiers of contemporary Newtonian science. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of this phase of his life is the insurmountable fidelity towards all esoteric mentors. His occult-minded brother-in-law, Benzelius, had liaised with the great Enlightenment philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz um, in 1697, an affair Swedenborg hoped to recapitulate when he eventually visited Hanover. Leibniz was away in Vienna at the time and was unable to host, though the geographical barrier did little to inhibit the subsequent influence. In fact, Many of Swedenborg's ideas derive from the intellectual musings of this great Cartesian interlocutor. Um, just like Leibniz, uh, Swedenborg was convinced that the universe was hewn from a single substance that spontaneously divided into three different vibrational energies, forcing an anatomical split into three tiers or layers, an intangible spiritual and imaginative plane, an intermediary cerebral moral and living plane and a lower palpable physical plane. Everything that existed or had acquired an existence inhabited all planes in slightly variegated forms, forming a quintessential law of esoteric correspondences. Existing at the echelon of the order, God, the divine mind and supernal spiritual sun diffused through the multifaceted fabric in the manner that physical light travels through our solar system passing through each of the spiritual, rational and natural spheres and instilling the true and counterpart of items and degrees with life. This theoretical framework encompasses platonic repercussions whereby the idealistic and utopian ideals so dear to man, unconditional love, compassion, wisdom, truth, might garner unhindered expression and potentiality in the highest heaven and in the being of God. 
Hence, under a Platonic tutelage, the doctrine of Trinitarianism was rejected. Swedenborg was convinced that God had become wholly human in the figure of Jesus Christ and had somehow managed to preserve his persona after the crucifixion. God, therefore, was an everlasting mortal. Swedenborg was a prolific writer. Many scientific works poured out of him during the first 56 years of his life, and a vast quantity of them explored and developed ideas well ahead of his time. These wonderful publications should have heralded the locus classicus of a golden age for Swedenborg. Instead, they evolved into dissatisfying and intellectually frustrating experiences, explicitly because Sweden, Sweden's academic establishment ignored them completely. The perception of academic apathy and incessant lack of reassurance spurred an internal crisis that could only be reconciled through a resynthesis and redirection of intellectual thought. His scientific and mechanistic views were unable to harness a reaction, uh, so he turned to his esoteric leanings for help. The first eruptions of the esoteric occurred 11 years before his decisive metaphysical vision in a publication entitled The Infinite and the Final Cause of Creation, which was published in 1734, in which the purely mathematical and mechanistic notions of the world, so dear to trial and error and chance, were being usurped by an animistic and fundamentally interconnected one mediated by generative energies and teleological concerns. Only six years later, two substantial publications called Dynamics of the Soul's Domain and The Soul's Domain, uh, which were published in 1740 to 1741 and then 1744 to 1745, revealed the 31 known alchemical and mystical ambitions to discover the base substance of which all things are made, as well as the seed of the human soul. To arrive at palpable conclusions, Swedenborg borrowed the Neoplatonic notion which viewed microcosm and the physical world as being a debased reflection of the empyrean of God, the seed of eternal ideas and platonic forms. The soul itself, Swedenborg reasoned, was inexact by nature and for that reason belonged to a realm neither here nor there, to an intermediary dimension sourced by the Arceus, a ubiquitous primal energy that was quite literally the life of macrocosm and microcosm, heaven and earth. God and human being, Neoplatonic inclinations to view the cosmos as a multiverse or a hierarchical ladder of dimensions obfuscated Swedenborg's assignment, at least until he could frame what the common denomination between worlds was and demarcate the soul. He proceeded along a radical path of inquiry that unearthed and weighed up disparately related um, forces. So he looked at etheric fluid, magnetism and electricity. Um, in a bid to implicate the, the cosmic accompl uh, accomplice. The first two were dutifully rejected, uh, but found a home in Franz Anton Mesmer's philosophy of animal magnetism, otherwise known as mesmerism. In the end, Swedenborg deduced that the medium responsible was an electric vibration of sorts, a vital force, bringing to mind the idea of a coveted vital life principle that was propagated by the likes of Arnold of Villanova, uh, Paracelsus, and Frater Albertus. According to Swedenborg, this vital substance underpinned the cosmic spheres, both physical and paraphysical, as well as the soul of man, with the individual differences and characteristics between the two uh, being fomented by vibrational frequency or level of vibrations. The overarching substance was theorized to be indestructible, a singularity that implied immortal or mortality for the human soul when its operations were transposed to the physical level. That's the end of part one, and I'll see you soon for part two.